Um, thank you all for coming. This is uh, really a pleasure to share my um, kind of ongoing research project with you. Um, and I, I'll give you the punchline in advance, which is to say I have no tidy kind of takeaway conclusions from this talk today. I wish I could package everything up with a bow and say this is how it is or how it should be. Um, but what I'm really going to do is walk you through what I find to be a really fascinating but incredibly complex and messy landscape um, in Indonesian Borneo. And unfortunately, there are really no easy answers in a place like this. But um, I think in light of what you've all been kind of attending to in this seminar series and probably in other parts of your work, I hope that you are thinking about sustainable development and what that term means in a place like this, uh, what it means in Indonesia. Um, is it even relevant? Is it the sort of framework we should be using? Um, and like, what does that even look like or what could it look like in a place like this? And again, I don't have a, an answer to that, but I'm sort of putting it out there as a kind of way to maybe think about um, what's happening in Indonesia's peatlands. Um, so to kind of start with this sort of big problem, um, so a lot of this is, I'm drawing on research that I started in 2012. Uh, I did my PhD dissertation kind of on, in this site I'm going to talk about today, um, and I've been back a couple of times since. Um, and sort of conveniently for me, right as I was about to defend my dissertation and I was writing my concluding chapter, um, the biggest fires in Indonesian history broke out um, across Indonesia's peatlands, including really severe fires in the site where I had been doing my research. So it provided a very sort of easy way for me to kind of end my dissertation, but also catalyzed, I think, uh, my longer term interest and in, in to keep going back to this place because it is such a sort of massive um, site for just like all of these problems around capital um, investment and uh, peatland development and really complex <laughs> ecosystems that are severely degrading with no real kind of answer as to how to fix that. Um, so this is kind of just a snapshot from the fall of 2015. Um, between August and November, Indonesia experienced the, the biggest fires in history. Um, the other fires that had been really quite almost as large as these were in 1997, 1998. Um, and both of these years, what they have in common is that they're El Nino years, right? So El Nino, the kind of global El Nino weather phenomenon, um, while it has really varying effects across the globe, it hits, um, it often hits Indonesian Borneo really hard in that it, it causes prolonged drought. So they basically didn't have a wet season which typically runs from, uh, like, it usually starts, like, the rains will start in October, and it'll rain through, like, February or March. Um, so earlier that year, in early 2015, they had a really dry year. They dried out the peatlands. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what that does. But it, when you have drained peatlands, you get these really catastrophic fires that actually burn sort of underground. Um, so this was the problem across Indonesia. And, you know, the national... And international media was really quite concerned about this. This is a, a NASA snapshot of what the smoke and haze, it's called haze, <laughs> which is really a euphemism because it's really very dense smoke um, laden with particulate matter that some of the most toxic um, air that we could possibly breathe in because it contains a really high concentration of uh, PM 2.5 or particulate matter 2.5, which is the smallest, the smallest particulates that penetrate really deep into our lungs. Um, so this affected really all of like southern Southeast Asia. You could see where that box um, Singapore um, was sort of blanketed with this really dense smoke haze for several months. Um, you know, the Singaporean media, which is obviously you know, extremely sophisticated, um, was putting out these numbers like the, the air quality index, which is, you know, like above 100 is considered sort of unhealthy. Um, it's not really something we would see in Ithaca, but Singapore had, a, had many weeks where it was over 300. Um, and the media, especially the international media, was really capturing this very well. Um, you know, Singaporeans weren't really going outside. Um, but by comparison, what the international media was not really capturing is that in Kalimantan, so this area uh, down here, where I'm going to talk about today, had an air quality index index for over a month of over 2,000. Um, so this is like, you know, this is uh, like eight, almost eight times higher than it was in Singapore, right? It was extremely unhealthy for anyone to go outside. Um, it's attributed to numerous, uh, there was actually a Harvard study put out shortly after that said there'll be an early mortality of 100,000 Indonesians um, as a result of this episode of, of really intense air pollution. So. This was a really acute kind of environmental crisis that hit Southeast Asia. Um, it wasn't the first time it happened, and it's probably not the last time either. Um, but all of this catalyzed just kind of renewed attention to like what to do with these peatlands, right? They've been drained across um, roughly 20 to 30 million hectares between Sumatra. So Sumatra Island is uh, this island over here, here. And then all across um, Kalimantan, so the five provinces of Kalimantan, have really um, intense kind of development across their peatlands. Um, so just to put a couple of like really big abstract numbers into perspective, um, in 2015, in the latter portion of 2015, those yellow lines are the days in which um, Indonesia's daily carbon emissions exceeded those of the, produced by the U.S. economy. 
right? So just these fires were producing way more than the entire United States produces, right, carbon emissions. Um, and this was true also in 1997-98. There was a really prominent paper that actually gained a lot of traction because it came up with these numbers that showed that the fires in 1997-98 um, on a daily basis were producing more carbon emissions than all of Europe's transportation sectors, right? So all of the car emissions from Europe. That's how much carbon is being produced by these fires, um, just as a result of burning soil and vegetation. Um, again, so the picture I took on the left, this was in the, the capital city of central Kalimantan province in 2014, and just a year later, the exact same location, um, a picture that was in the New York Times, right? So this is no ordinary smoke. This is not just like wood, if you're burning wood, but peat is actually, um, it, you could basically think of it as pre-coal, right? So if given another like 10, 30, I don't know, actually, I don't know in geological time how many more years, but let's say 50,000 years, it'll turn into coal, right? So it's kind of like burning it's almost like burning coal beds right across a really large landscape. That's quite, um, quite how toxic it is. Um, this is a picture from a friend in some of the villages, again, just to kind of put some of the, the air pollution issue into perspective. Um, whereas the crisis in Singapore, right, people there, it's one of the wealthiest countries in the world, right, people have access to cars, they have air conditioning, air, conditioning, air filtration, um, you know, enclosed public transit where they are actually able to kind of go about their daily lives without spending too much time outside. Um, if anyone's been to a rural village, you know that is completely not the case, right? Like people don't have cars, they ride motorbikes if they have vehicles at all. Um, air, you know, houses are not ventilated, they don't have air conditioning, they usually don't even have fans. Um, and of course, children, although they canceled school, were still not able to find shelter from, from any of the smoke. So it's really a, quite a big public health crisis. Um, so there's a couple of different dynamics that are going on here, and I'm going to sort of, it's really hard to disentangle them. Um, I think they're, and that's kind of the point, right, is that all of these things are uh, very interrelated in complex ways, but I'm going to sort of walk you through the site, a history of the site actually, to show you kind of how these things come together in this place. So part of what's happening here, right, is oil palm, primarily oil palm development um, across Indonesia, which exploded since 2000. Um, there's roughly 20 million hectares of oil palm in Indonesia right now, um, and it's an ongoing kind of expansion issue for the country um, because it's been a real kind of primary uh, engine of their economic development on a national scale. Um, pulpwood, which is mostly acacia trees, which is grown for, say, IKEA furniture. Um, IKEA sources a lot of their wood pulp from Indonesian acacia trees um, as well, and that's also kind of an issue in peatlands. But oil palm gets a lot of attention um, for this reason. Of course, climate change politics, right, when you've got carbon emissions on the magnitude that I showed you, um, this plays into the kind of Indonesia's position in the global kind of climate change arena um, because they're both seen as now a, a large source of carbon, especially when these, in the years that these fires are happening. But they're also, because they have such incredible... Um, tropical forests, the third largest tropical forest in the world, um, they're also a source of mitigation for climate change, right? So they play this sort of really unusual role in being both a source and a mitigator kind of for, for climate change. Um, and that that's plays out in the national kind of arena and really also very complex ways, um, which I'll talk a little bit about at the end. And of course, the national economic development, right, is like how do you, how does Indonesia, right, which has had about 6% economic growth, again, at a national scale, how does the country kind of try to keep that up without relying on expanding oil palm? It's really quite difficult for them. Um, so a little bit about tropical peat ecology. Um, I never thought, I was never, I was never, I have no background in ecology formally and I never thought I would end up doing research in peat swamps, but um, I kind of accidentally fell into this ecosystem. <laughs> Literally, you can't really go there without kind of falling into the swamps. Um, and I sort of fell in love with these places because they're really quite bizarre. And when they're not completely degraded and burning, they're actually quite beautiful, right? So I'm not normally a swamp person, but um, I kind of grew to love these swamps. So this is a semi-intact peat swamp. Um, you can see semi-intact because the trees in the middle have clearly been cut down. Um, but the kind of crucial part is that it's still waterlogged, right? So there's still this kind of black, black these are black water swamps. So the, the water itself appears to be black. Um, if you look up close, it's actually dark brown. It looks like tea. Um, it's really laden with tannins, which come from the peat soil itself. Um, and the water tends to be, you know, these, this area is extremely flat. It's like pancake flat over several million hectares. So you know, you don't really get rapids in the rivers or anything like that. It's just a very still kind of calm place. So what happens, at least in, in the peatlands that are found in Kalimantan, is that 
peat is basically partially decomposed vegetation, right? So it's vegetation that because it's so hot in the tropics, and of course you get peat in cold climates also. If you ever have Laphroaig scotch, you might know that comes from peat in Scotland. There's peat all throughout the boreal areas of the world. Um, but those tend to be formed from mosses or really small plants. Um, and the process is the same in the tropics, but the vegetation is really different, right? Because in the tropics you get really large trees. Um, they tend to fall over and because there's so much rain, the rain basically covers everything and um, once that happens, the stuff can't decompose, right? It doesn't have access to oxygen to decompose. So basically it gets buried by water. Sometimes it decomposes, but a lot of it doesn't. So you get this really thick formation of peat. It can be up to 20 meters deep, um, usually between two rivers in Borneo and also in Sumatra. Um, so it actually forms these domes, right? You get these kind of dome-like structures between rivers um, under kind of natural conditions. Um, and then if you were to dig or like take soil cores, you would very quickly hit a lot of very large tree stumps. So it's not really soil like you would see anywhere around here, but it's it's this really kind of muddy, mucky stuff with like huge kind of logs and, and trees and branches sort of stuck in it from um, tens of thousands of years ago. Um, so what happens is that if you want to use any of this area for large scale agriculture. Um, so again, there's been agriculture throughout uh, this part of Kalimantan for a long time, but small scale agriculture that the Dayak indigenous people practiced, they didn't have access to this sort of equipment where they could dredge and, and take excavators, right, and dig canals that were large enough to do major damage to the peatlands. So they tended to just do kind of small scale agriculture really close to the rivers, which tends to be within a kilometer of the rivers, um, much more kind of clay and mineral based soils. The peat's not nearly as thick. So they were able to use some of that land but um, for agriculture. But in general, the Dayaks always avoided the middle of the peat domes because they knew it was just not suitable for agriculture. Um, but since around the 60s, 70s, um, the Indonesian government got very interested in these peatlands because there's a huge amount of space. Population densities tend to be quite low. Um, they had this sort of perception that there wasn't a lot of land conflict there. Um, so they were often seeking out these sort of what they perceived as empty lands for larger scale agricultural projects. So what happens when you try to drain this land, because you've got to get the water out, right, if you want to grow anything, um, and you dig these really kind of large canals through, you get two simultaneous processes. So um, what happens is that the soil, immediate, uh, the soil above the water table, so if it's dry, immediately starts to oxidize. It undergoes microbial oxidation, um, which means it's literally sort of evaporating into the atmosphere, right? So the soil is continuously disappearing. Um, and over the course of, say, a decade, you could lose about half a meter or a meter of soil just due to microbial oxidation. Um, but the other process that happens is that anything above the water table when it's quite dry is extremely flammable, right? Because it's basically this pre-coal, it's really carbon dense. Um, so any fire source can really set this stuff on fire. And not just the surface, the surface vegetation or the trees or grasses above the soil, but the soil itself will actually start to burn. Um, so eventually Eventually over time, like over several decades, um, the soil literally disappears and you kind of end up with this like reflooded area. And that's starting to happen in a lot of peatlands in Indonesia. Okay, so the reason I started working here in the first place actually is because um, I guess in 2011, I was at C4, which some people here have um, spent a lot of time at the Center for Tropical for, C yeah, Center for International forestry research, yeah, I've forgotten the acronym, um, in, in Java. And somebody who was working there told me about the history of the Mega Rice Project. And I went, wait, what? That sounds crazy, right? Like, what is a Mega Rice Project? And um, an internet search actually turned up very little. There was not a lot of history written about this place. There were sort of some basic stories I could find, but not a lot of detail. So I kind of, without a lot of, a lot of really in-depth thinking, decided to write my entire dissertation on the Mega Rice Project. Because again, it seemed like a really fascinating history, but the ongoing kind of politics of the place um, were playing out in very interesting ways in relation to kind of climate change politics and oil palm. So the Mega Rice Project is basically, it was a project that um, President Suharto, the former dictator of Indonesia, uh, he was dictator from about, I shouldn't just say dictator, dictator, authoritarian president from the 60s to 1998. Um, he had his, his eye on a million hectares of peatland in central Kalimantan province, right? So around the early 90s, he sent some, some researchers out to decide if they could actually drain the peatlands and grow a million hectares of rice, right? So it was this kind of big political vision for him. He was really after um, food self-sufficiency for the country because Java, which produces a lot of rice for Indonesia, uh, was rapidly developing kind of urban, it was urbanizing. So they were losing a lot of rice paddies um, to that in, in Java and they wanted to kind of offset that rice production elsewhere. So 
if this sounds like sort of a simplistic scheme, like it, it really was, right? Like they did not have really in-depth engineering to figure out whether they could do this. Um, he just wanted this kind of big, splashy political move to say, let's grow a million hectares of rice, right? So he could advertise this. So he selected this part of southern central Kalimantan province, which um, because it appeared to be sort of empty, right, there wasn't a lot going on there, um, seemed to be perfect, right, because it wasn't very densely populated. But the reason for that is because it was on some of the deepest peatland um, in all of Kalimantan, right? So the Dayaks who'd been living in the area, they had been doing logging and fishing and things, but they knew, like, you couldn't grow rice in this area. Um, they had sort of upland rice they would grow in, in parts of mineral soils, but this area was otherwise really not suitable for agriculture. So nevertheless, um, this, uh, this project started in 1996. It happened really, really quickly. Over the course of about six months, they sent in a lot of Japanese contractors um, with a lot of equipment, excavators, to build um, roughly 10,000 kilometers of canals in this area. Um, and believe it or not, they actually didn't even, they didn't fully execute the project they had planned, right? So not all million hectares got drained and developed, but um, about half of it did. Um, and the rest of the hydrological system around it was severely affected by this canal drainage. Um, so these pictures I just found incredible that they were taken by one of the contractors, P.T. Wijaya, you can see is a, it's an Indonesian name. Um, they were affiliated with the project. Um, and this is what they did, right? So tim the timber was cut down extremely rapidly. That all went to Suharto's cronies. Um, they dug these canals and then immediately, right, the water from the peatlands is just like funneled into these canals. Um, the project was also part of the country's transmigration scheme. So these transmigration projects had been going on for about 30 years. Um, and it was basically a political move to relocate people from Java and Bali, which are, um, Java is one of the, it's actually the most densely populated island on the planet, um, to some of Indonesia's kind of outer islands, right? Which again, didn't have as many people living in them. Um, and it was a way to both move people out, but also to settle some of these outer islands that were always perceived to be kind of wild or uncultivated, right? Because they were, mostly inhabited by indigenous people or other, like, other ethnic groups that were not Javanese, um, with Javanese-style agriculture, right, which was very productive for the government, but seen as really superior um, to Suharto. So part of the project was to build um, tens of thousands of these transmigration houses, which they, they were able to build some. These things went up really, really rapidly. Um, you can see, again, in sort of drained peatland, this happened in a couple of months, um, just the scale of what it looked like. Um, and this guy, Patrice Levang, who some of you might actually know, I don't know if you know him, yeah, um, he was uh, part of the project as well, or he was not really working for the project, but aware of what was happening. And um, he described it as watching a movie unfold, right? He was like, if you look at these photographs, like these houses were going up so rapidly, it was like a movie reel, right? Um, that was just happening kind of in no time. So for about six months in 1997, mid 1997, um, Suharto actually flew into the site. He, uh, he was there for about two hours. He arrived on a private helicopter. Um, and a lot of people were really concerned about showing him the best version of, you know, showing him that the, the mega price project was a success, even though it wasn't really producing a lot of rice. So they actually grabbed vegetables and rice from other areas and they put it like around the place where his helicopter was landing. This sounds a little like sort of Trumpy and it kind of, I guess, was. Um, in that sense, right? So Suharto lands for two hours. He sees the rice, he sees the vegetables, he meets some of the Javanese trans migrants. Um, they say, yes, thank you so much. We have these houses. Um, he declares the project a success, right? And he flies off. Um, and a lot of his, his agricultural ministers from the area also sort of toured around and said, oh, this is great, because there were a couple of patches where they were able to grow rice. But in general, what happened is that they were trying to grow Javanese wet style, like wet cultivated rice in the peatlands, which is like transplanting um, one agricultural system from a completely different ecosystem to another, right? Which I'm sure you guys have learned many examples of which this typically does not work, right? For all sorts of reasons of soil contamination, pH levels were different, um, flooding was different, right? They weren't able to have this sort of same um, uh, uh, terrace irrigation that they have in Java and Bali and the peatlands. So for numerous reasons, right, this project really just didn't grow much rice. Um, and whatever rice they did grow, people tell me, was completely eaten by rats, right? They had a major pest infestation. Um, so late 1997, uh, this was November, um, again, El Nino had kind of swept through the area, right? They weren't getting the rains they needed. Um, and these drains, these drains peatlands started to catch on fire, right? Because people were trying to use fire to, say, clear out dried brush and things like that. 
Um, and this turns into, again, a major environmental catastrophe, very similar to the one that happened in 2015. The difference being is that Suharto was basically on the verge of being overthrown, right? So the Asian financial crisis was also starting to happen around this time. Um, Indonesia, had this, Indonesia had this really rapid inflation, right? People's money is suddenly worthless. Um, and he was overthrown by students in Jakarta in uh, February, I believe, February, March of, of 1998. Um, so because that happened, the project was basically abruptly ended, right? So uh, a lot of the transmigrant houses weren't completed. A lot of the transmigrants that had been slated to be re relocated there didn't move there. Um, so it was a kind of a couple of things, right? The project wasn't really working anyway. But then for political reasons, because the budget got completely reconfigured as Indonesia was going through this really rapid transition to democracy, um, a lot of the contractors were not being paid, right? So they left the project. So um, if you talk to people in the area, they often refer to the Mega Rice Project as sort of this half success. And it would have been a success if Suharto was still president, right? Because the way that they see it is like, well, this project was never finished, right? Because Suharto wasn't president. He never got to finish the project. If only they had finished it, you know, it might have worked, um, which is, you know, not, not quite accurate because the thing was sort of not slated to work at the scale that they were trying to do it anyway. Um, but nevertheless, that's kind of the perception there. Um, so what's happened since, right? So there's been, this site has been really kind of a hot, a hot pet, a hotbed of like all of these different sort of political initiatives to try to restore the area. Um, so, you know, the, 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 Indonesian government since 1998, a lot of the Suharto cronies were still in government right after. Um, and nobody really wanted to talk about the Mega Rice Project because people really knew it had been a major disaster. Right? These fires were really catastrophic, although that wasn't the only site um, of the fires. They were particularly bad in this area. Um, so it started to, this area started to attract a lot of attention for kind of large aid-funded projects. Um, the first interest, actually, the first international interest came from the Royal Dutch Shell Company um, because in the early 2000s, they started seeing this as a potential carbon offset. Um, this is when the you know, oil and gas fossil fuel companies were very much invested in paying for some of these projects. Um, again, because they knew, you know, they knew what was happening. Um, and again, the sort of end story of where we're at now, which I will circle back to, is that there's still very little consensus among all the stakeholders, right, on what to do with a site like this, right? Like, can it be restored? Is, it, is restoration even possible in a landscape like this, right? If it's not restoration, is rehabilitation possible in a landscape like this? Um, should we just hand it all over to the oil palm companies and let them manage it, right? Because that's the perspective of a lot of, of the companies. Um, but people in the area also don't really have a kind of clear consensus. The villagers don't have a consensus over what to do with it because they use these canals, right? So the canals that were built by the project has allowed them extraordinary access to parts of the landscape that they didn't normally have. And they've gotten really used to that, right? They've been there for over 20 years now. So people do logging and fishing and things in places um, that they didn't normally have access. So just to give you a sense of kind of what it's like to go through here, this is one of the, the big mega rice canals. Um, our boat's really small. It's just like this wide. Um, but you can see how easy it is, right, to travel around this place now that used to be extremely difficult um, to access. Because again, you're in a swamp, you can't really walk through, it's really muddy. Um, so now it's really easy to just kind of travel to fish in these areas. Um, people will plant rubber trees along the sides. Um, let's see, another kind of example of just what the ecosystem looks like. This isn't actually a more natural river on the kind of edge of the Mega Rice Project. Um, but it's surrounded by these sort of burned out areas that perpetually catch fire. I just really love sitting in these small boats and riding through the swamp. So <laughs> any chance I can share videos of that, right? Um. OK, so you can see some of the activities that are happening there now at a really kind of local scale. Um, on the left, those are rubber trees in the back. So people will often plant rubber um, close to the canals where the soil is relatively dry and there's an, enough minerals to grow rubber. Um, it's also a way of claiming land, right? So they use, they kind of make a land claim through planting trees that can be somewhat profitable, although the price of rubber has been so low for the last five years that they rarely harvest the rubber anymore. They're sort of just there as a land claim. Um, and the other interesting thing that I saw a lot of when I've been through this the area is that they do grow rice, right? But they grow indigenous Dayak rice, which is not the same kind of rice that you grow in Javanese and Balinese patties. Um, so they will plant sort of rice. This is a, a burned out landscape, right? You can see the tree stumps. It's been, it's probably had several cycles of fire in the last 10 to 15 years. Um, but they will grow rice, kind of indigenous rice in parts of this area. 
Um, another big kind of issue that's ongoing is obviously logging, right? Because again, people now use the canals to access parts of the forest um, that they didn't normally have access to. Um, the police tend to be in on this, right? If you go to the sawmill outside of town, it's all technically illegal, um, but there's usually some cop sitting nearby who's getting paid off, right, just by the sawmill, the guys running the sawmill to sort of oversee all of this, right? Turn a blind eye to what's happening. Um, those are logging camps again on the side. So one thing that I've, I've, I just want to sort of conceptualize for you in, in real brief, and this is in, uh, expanded on in the paper that I think Julie uh, put up on the website for you if you want to look more in depth about this. But um, the sort of generally two approaches to dealing with this type of landscape, um, and again, this is not the only place in Indonesia, but it's really gotten the most attention and a lot of the, the largest investments to try to kind of curb the fires and the ongoing degradation, um, is this car what I call carbon-driven science, right? So proposals to rehabilitate the peatland um, as a carbon offset, right? Because if you can stop carbon emissions, then it turns into a carbon sink, right? And, um, and then you can sell those credits on some sort of proposed global carbon market. Um, of course, there is no global carbon market, so a lot of attempts to do those types of projects have not really gone anywhere. Um, or they've been dependent on donors rather than any sort of external market mechanism to keep them going. Um, and this has recently played into Indonesia's commitments to the Paris Agreement. Um, interestingly, as a sort of side note, they were an early signer to the Paris Agreement because they, for a very a long time, I think since 2007, um, they made pledges to reduce their uh, carbon um, emissions uh, up to 40% if they had international investment um, help with that. So all of this plays into kind of Indonesia's position to be a sort of carbon mitigator, um, at least at a global level. Although interestingly, the Indonesian election was uh, yesterday, it just ended, national election. Um, and it, not to get into detail about that, but one of the ministers that was um, in the kind of old cabinet who, and that president has been, looks like reelected, um, has made a sort of similar to what Trump has done, trying to pull Indonesia out of the Paris Agreement um, because he says the EU has banned oil palm, right? And in a similar way to the way that Trump has pulled out of the Paris Agreement to try to protect the coal industry, Indonesia is looking at that as a sort of playbook to say, well, we need to protect our oil palm industry, right? So if, if the EU is going to ban oil palm, and that's a significant part of our economic development, development, then we don't want to be part of the Paris Agreement. Um, so these, these things really play, play into one another significantly. Um, but on the other side of the science is you've got this really like what's big ag funded, like lobbyist driven, um, what I call, you know, corporate industrial science. So you have these scientists that work for the oil palm industry that have produced a lot of data and they publish, they publish papers, not in international journals, but they publish them nonetheless and they give talks at really big conferences. And they basically say that oil palm does not cause carbon emissions. Um, um, and if it does, it can be managed, right? And that the oil palm plantations can manage these fires. So it's this sort of way of saying, if we just put all of this land under corporate control, these fires can be managed, right? We can prevent fires. We can have, you know, better firefighting forces. We can have fire watchers. We can do all of these things to make sure that the plantations themselves are preventing fire risk. Um, and that's proven to not really not really work particularly well across Indonesia. Um, so just a couple of kind of examples of what this carbon-driven science or trying to tie a place like this to an international carbon market look like. Um, so it's this really mainstream scientific consensus among scientists who work in the area, both foreign and domestic, um, that this degraded peatland has to be rehabilitated, right, because it's such a source of carbon emissions. Um, so over the last 20 years, there have been a series of projects to try to dam the canals. Um, and these have really not worked uh, for mostly for engineering reasons, because um, obviously if you just put up a single dam across the canal, the water is still going through, right? So you don't actually get water, enough water spillage out to reflood the kind of adjacent areas. Um, the other issue, of course, is, is because this area is inhabited, right? You can't just construct these inhabited, kind of, I mean, these engineering projects in a landscape and expect that people not, who live there are not going to notice, right, or take issue with some of these projects. So most dams like this, especially the earliest ones, um, have been broken by people living there because they want to access the canals. Um, I also interviewed several people who were actually being paid by projects to build the canal, the dams like you see on the on the right, and then they would actually also be paid by loggers who wanted to break the canal, right? So there was sort of cycles of, of the, the these these small canal owners being paid both by donors to build um, to build dams, and then by loggers trying to access the canals again, right? So they were making quite a lot of money off of this sort of opening and closure of these of these small dams. Um, so another part of the project, uh, a project that I was kind of loosely affiliated with, um, 
is, a, is an ongoing project to try to measure the carbon emissions in the site, right? And I won't really go into this. But nevertheless, there's been an enormous amount of data about carbon emissions produced from this area. Um, and this is really important, again, if Indonesia has any kind of hope of tying a landscape like this. Um, you need really precise data, you know, as demanded by a global market to try to be incorporated into that. Um, yeah, so I sort of mentioned this already, but the corporate industrial science is really um, the science that's affiliated with the oil palm industry. A lot of it's actually based in Malaysia. Um, Malaysia doesn't have as many as much land under oil palm plantations, but um, most of the capital investment is actually based in Malaysia or Singapore. Um, so the two countries are really kind of deeply intertwined when it comes to the oil palm industry. It's a lot of Malaysian companies contracting and subcontracting on Indonesian land um, to grow a lot of this. So they often tend to support these findings, right? And this matters at a policy level for the government, right? Because even if, you know, most scientists who are otherwise working in the area say, you know, excuse my language, they've all often said these publications are bullshit, right? Their numbers are bullshit. Um, but these numbers have a lot of sway at the, at the government level, right? Because the Indonesian government, many players in the government, they want to hear that they can keep expanding oil palm, right? They're really invested in this industry. So it's helpful to, for them to hear this kind of science that, that supports what they want to do. Um, and again, at a kind of local level, um, the top picture is an area that had been, I believe, rubber trees. It had been the village's rubber, kind of rubber, small rubber plantation, um, cooperatively managed by the people in the village where I was staying. Um, and I, was, I went back about four months later, and the whole thing had been sort of bulldozed over um, because those people had chosen to sell their land to the oil palm company. Um, and by chosen, I, it's, it's, you know, the, the choice in their agency in doing so is really tenuous because they didn't get much money for this. Um, and if you talk to them, you'll very quickly realized that um, in some ways they, f they really felt coerced into selling their land um, or even threatened into selling their land to do this. This wasn't something they were really happy about, um, to give up you know, land that had been in their families for generations for something like $200, right? It was not a large amount of money. Um, in other areas, there were actually illegal excavators that were widening some of the mega rice canals to redrain areas, again, so plantation companies could come in and use access roads and things. OK, so really quickly, a couple minutes on on what's happened, uh, what happened in 2015 and what's happened since. So I joined a different project actually in the same field site with some fire scientists that were working there to try to understand exactly what causes the subterranean fires. So from a fire science perspective, they wanted to know what the biophysical mechanisms were from which surface vegetation would ignite the subsurface peat soil. Because that there's been very little research done on this. Um, and the, way, the reason that this is really important is because um, most of the, the um, estimations of how much peatlands burn in, a, say, a year like 2015 is all based on just surface burning, right? So people take aerial photographs or they use remote sensing to look at the total area burned, and they, they make uh, rough calculations in aggregate of how much carbon is lost right from that surface area. But because these fires burn down and not just out, we actually don't know how much carbon is lost because that really depends on how deep the fire went, right? And that's been really hard to measure. So what these scientists have been trying to do is build a model to try to predict how much carbon would be lost if we can actually better estimate how much soil has burned and what was in that soil. So part of what we were doing was this kind of retrospective fire analysis um, a year later to try to see like what were these fires, right? What actually burned during the large, during the large fire season um, and what what human actions might have caused these fires right and how also how did people who were living in the area actually change the environment to enable some of these areas to burn right either deeper or kind of more widespread um, so this is what peat fire looks like. Again, it's not these kind of large flaming fires um, you'd see, say, in the American West. Um, it's really kind of more smoke heavy. Uh, these were the fire monitoring team and some people that I know who were out there during fire season actually taking measurements just as the fires were still burning um, or just after they had burned. And you can see just how quickly these things burn across the landscape. But again, where you see the kind of white stuff, those are also places where the, the fire actually burned down into the soil, not just across. Um, so this is the same site a year later when we went back. You could see how fast some of the grasses regrow. But trying to figure out like what happened here, right? Like what was here before? And this is not about criminalizing people who were in the area, right? Because most people don't intend to set landscape scale fires like this. But trying to understand like what was here before the fire and what might have burned, right? And what kind of conditions led to those fires. Um, I'm going to skip that. So just to give you a sense in the kind of area where we work, we've been working, this is about a 300,000 hectare site. It's part of the Mega Rice site. Um, you can see the, the big fire season, 1997-98. And then in 2015, just how many fire hotspots were burning. It was something like 2,000, I think, just in the, in the research area alone. Um, 
So a couple more images. So another site we visited in 2016 after the fires was an area that had actually been planted by um, a red project, so uh, restoring ecosystems from degradation and deforestation. Um, they had planted a huge area of kind of trees and one part of the peatland to try to restore it. Um, and somebody, we think intentionally, had actually burned um, a lot of that restoration area and then claimed it by planting oil palm, right, or very quickly subcontracted it to an oil palm company. Um, because within months of the 2015 fires, this huge area had been planted with these oil palm saplings you can see on the left. Um, and I just think this is a really remarkable picture, right? Because you've got on the left, right, you have the black, um, the black water peat, peat water, black, black peat water, and then you've got this really visible layer of peat, right? So this is all under the surface. And you can see just how much stuff is embedded in the soil that burns, right, when the fires go under the surface. And then, of course, on top of that, you've got this kind of attempt to make a really quick gain, right, or claim the land from oil palm, even though oil palm over the long term does not really flourish, right, in an ecosystem like this. Um, it tends to wither or die within about 10 years rather than 25, which is the kind of normal life cycle. Um, but nevertheless, this kind of attempt to really quickly claim land um, and sell it, you know, or sell it to the companies um, follows every one of these kind of large fire seasons. Um, I think I'm going to skip this actually. Just a, so this was the burning, hot burning peat. Um, so a really typical response to large. Um, these large-scale fires and the severe fire seasons has been uh, what seems like common sense, right, which is to institute fire bans at kind of all scales of government. Um, and this is sort of a, a, a subject for an entirely other talk, so I'm not going to uh, really do justice to this. But I just would like to point out, so these pictures, this is um, a sign in the canal area where some villagers have some agricultural land um, that says, like, no smoking's allowed. Um, because this is a farming area, um, it's forbidden to like toss cigarettes right into the ground because there's still this perception that cigarettes cause some of these landscape scale fires, even though there's never been any evidence for this. Um, the picture on the right is in one of the villages that the local government put up, which basically says it's forbidden to burn your land and burn the forest. Um, and this is really problematic for a number of reasons, right? Because again, the Dayak communities, when they have traditionally farmed near the rivers, they've always used fire as part of their agricultural system, right? Um, because if you can see the grasses and shrubs in this picture on the left, this covers all of their land and it grows really, really quickly, right? So without the use of fire, they both have no way to clear their land um, ahead of planting season because they don't have access to right, these kind of capital intensive machinery, um, but they also need the fire to add nutrients to these soils because peat soils tend to be very nutrient poor. Um, so what's, what's happened since then, and I've, I've seen this in several different parts of Kalimantan, is that because fires are now banned, right, it either forces people to use fires in really um, surreptitious and potentially dangerous ways that actually lead to more landscape scale fires because people aren't managing them, um, or it leads people to just abandon their land entirely right, and not use it to grow any, any rice or any any vegetables for the season and then try to turn to other means of livelihood um, uh, or to try to find other sources of income, right, which could also be illegal logging, um, could be working for the oil palm companies themselves, or in a lot of cases it's illegal mining, which is the subject of a whole different project. Um, so, you know, something that I think was really uh, telling was one of the farmers that I interviewed in 2016 um, describing their situation, right, as this sort of caught in this, this crux of, right, really complex policy responses um, and layers of history, right, that they've lived through in which this landscape can really no longer have fire, right? Like, I, I would also say, like, it's really hard to know how to use fire when the landscape has changed so fundamentally, right? The ecosystem has degraded to a point that it can, it really has a very low threshold for fire, um, and once fire goes through some of these peatlands, what we figured out to be more than four times, that ecosystem will actually never come back, right? So these landscape scale fires have really transformed the ecosystem to such a point that um, it really can't hold much fire, even if it's used in a kind of managed way. Um, but nevertheless, right, what this has done to a lot of the agricultural <laughs> farmers in the area, right, is kind of given them this, this self-identity saying, like, we are, all the, we are all the criminals here, like, we are now the arsonists, right, that have lead, led to these landscape scale fires, right? Um, so anyway, I'm going to end there because it's after one o'clock, but open for questions. Okay. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you.